Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Vanessa. Uh, yes, my name is Maury Morgan, and I'm going to unveil the dragon today. And this is the first presentation of today, and I thank you all for coming this afternoon. So before we begin the formal presentation, I'd like to ask that you be involved in a small activity. I'm going to show a word on the screen here, and very loudly, very confidently, I want you to shout out whether this word is positive, so scream good, or it's negative, so scream bad. Simply say good or bad, and this is participation of all the audience. Here we go. Good. Fantastic. <laughs> Everyone has 100% said good, and you may have had an image similar to this, a positive image, either subjectively or uh, consciously, you had an image like this. Next word. <laughs> good. <laughs> Now, you may have had an image similar to this, or uh, anyway, subconsciously or consciously, you felt this was negative. Unless perhaps you're, a, say, an 18 year old uh, new employee who lives with his parents and you, and you like to get away. Most of us in this room have a positive connotation to the, the word holiday and a negative connotation to the word overtime. Words have emotions. And I want you to keep that in consideration as I go through the presentation today. So I'm going to unveil the dragon. My name is Maureen Morgan. And uh, why am I qualified to talk to you today about dragons? Well, I've been in China, as Vanessa said, since 2001. Uh, my first trip to China was in 19, uh, 1989. And I'm married to a Chinese. I have a, a Shanghai-born son. And I built a company from scratch here in, in Shanghai. Uh, my family name is Morgan. And those of you who are uh, perhaps uh, buffs on, on names, know that Morgan is a Welsh name, this is the Welsh flag. So because the Welsh flag has a gigantic, uh, a gigantic dragon in it. Also, I should add that uh, my mother is Welsh as well, and that's just coincidence, because Morgan of course comes from my family lineage, and they met in Canada. Uh, and I called my son, my son Dylan, which is a Welsh name. And finally, I'm probably the only person in this room who has killed a dragon with a double-handed bastard sword. <laughs> I am a nerd. Yes, I played Dungeons and Dragons uh, back before we had uh, computer games like War, World of Warcraft. So hopefully that makes me qualified to talk to you today about unveiling the dragon. When all the speakers got invited to speak, we got given this subtitle. And uh, I'm going to read this for you just briefly. Societies worldwide are going through monumental social, technological and political changes which impacts the way that we think and do business. Unveiling the Dragon is a first-hand view of how China is impacting those changes worldwide and leading the global trends of the future. Now that sounds very positive, doesn't it? And for most of us in the room, it is positive. Firstly, we might be Chinese. So being riding the Dragon is a very positive thing for us. Second of all, if we're not Chinese, we chose to come to China. We weren't forced. We decided that this is the place for us. So all of this is very positive. But think about it. Think about the stories you have when you go home, back to the US, Europe, in my case, Australia. Does that positive feeling exist around the table amongst friends and family? Or do they have a different view of the time and the dragon that we're going through today? So by the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you a positive view of the time that we live in, and a positive view of that dragon. Let's begin. Let's look first of all at monumental changes. Monumental changes was the first part, the first paragraph of this presentation. The second part I'm going to talk about is the dragon and how that's important, again, going back to that positive language. So let's look at monumental changes first of all. Change is frightening. Change is frightening. How do we know this? Well, the most extreme form of change that we can have is a death, a death in the family. Uh, on a lesser case, we could lose a job, we could lose uh, a marriage. So change is frightening. For most people, it creates a feeling of isolation, it makes us feel uncomfortable, it creates self-doubt, and it creates fear. So if we're in the middle of monumentous change, would it be fair to say that some people in the world are going through monumentous fear? 
I think it's fair enough. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to see that there's nothing to fear at all. Perhaps not you, but the family and friends that you'll see when you go home. To do this, I'm not going to talk so much about 2012, the, two, the year that we live in today. I'm going to talk about another time, a time 1952, a time when your parents were probably growing up with your grandparents. Your parents were living at home, your grandparents were looking after them, it was the end of World War II, and life should have been pretty good. To do this, we'll look and we'll break down this subtitle into its parts, and we'll look first of all at social changes. Today, we know that a huge number of Chinese are on mobile technology, a huge number of Chinese are using the internet, and a huge number of Chinese are using internet on their mobile phones. We're talking about 800 and 500 million people for those different categories. Now, in 1952, 10 million TVs in America turned on to I Love Lucy. I want to bring that into perspective because the commercial television wasn't available until 1948. In four years, the, uh, the, the television changed the world that we know it. It was monumentous change, that's for sure. The internet's been around a lot longer than four years. In 1952, this is not a husband, wife, and mother-in-law. This is the same person. This is, this is George William Jorgensen, who later became Christine Williamson. Oh, Jorgensen, sorry. Christine Jorgensen. And this is the same man later on in his life. We might be talking about gay rights and marriage around the world in this year. But in 1952, a man became a woman. Now that's what he makes us change. Talking about China, bring us back to China. In 1952, the Chinese, for the first time, the People's Republic of China, marched under the red flag. This was the first time society had seen the new country that we know today. We might talk about China, continue talking about China and a particular matter up in Beijing. There's debate over whether one embassy should be publishing PMs uh, on its websites. In 1952, between 4,000 and 12,000 Londoners died because of particulate matter. Puts it into perspective, doesn't it? And the last thing, talking about particulate matter and pollution, 1951, you could smoke with a smile. You could smoke with your doctor. In 1952, Reader's Digest said, no, smoking will kill you. So things changed, didn't they? In 1952, when your parents and your grandparents were much more part of society today. So I'm not talking about 2012, I'm talking about 1952. It puts it into perspective of this monumentous change. Let's quickly look now at technological changes of 1952. Now this might look like a car engine, a straight six from Ford or GM. It's funny because it actually was produced by GM uh, laboratories, GM research. The man being operated is a man called Ocitec. He's a 41-year-old man who had a problem with his heart. They cut him open. They operated on his heart. He's the first bionic man of our time. Because while his heart was stopped and was being operated on, this six-cylinder uh, GM product was keeping his body alive. It was 1952, people. This was monumentous change. The Higgs boson. Some of us know the Higgs boson. It's a hot topic this year. The Higgs boson wouldn't be a topic if we didn't have the Big Bang Theory. Guess what year that was proposed? 1952. For those who are not, are not familiar with the Higgs boson, the Higgs boson uh, is a, a, a something that isn't, that proves that matter and antimatter exist at the same time, and potentially our grandkids and grandkids or great grandkids will be able to teleport home for, um, for Christmas or any type of birthdays. Technology. In 1951, we flew by propeller. In 1952, we flew by jet plane. That's monumentous. And in 1952, Bell Laboratories said, hey, we're going to license this technology so the world can use transistors. And here we are today in China, probably the, 
the most uh, successful country in the world based on computer technology. And finally, a disease that, uh, that, that even presidents were not immune from, that's polio. A cure was found and at least in the first world countries, polio has been eradicated. So this is incredible because this is not 2012, this is 1952. The monumentous change that we're going through isn't frightening. It's no different than what our parents and our grandparents went through. In fact, it might even be less so. Let's look at the last part, that political changes. The political changes that we went through in 1952. Now, if you're from Beijing in this room, I hope you have your passport. Because if you don't, you might have a problem with the authorities because of the three antis, or the three illegals. They are illegally entering China, illegally working in China and illegally overstaying your visa. It's happening now in 2012. But in 2000, sorry, 1952, there were five antis. There were five illegals. And they include bribery, tax evasion, and, and corruptions of all sorts. Today, we only have three. Back then, they had five. On the other side of the Pacific, Mac McCarthyism was taking over. Red was bad. And if you were a school teacher, you could, be, you could be thrown out of your job if you leaned to the left. If you were a naturalised American, you could even be thrown back to your place of birth. This was interesting times. While that was negative in the, in the Eurozone area, some positivity was happening. Six countries, Luxembourg, Belgium, West Germany, France, Italy and the Netherlands came together and formed the European Coal and Steel Union. And they decided that they would prevent World War III by locking up the resources between all those countries that were most likely to cause World War III. <laughs> this is interesting. This is 1952. But if we go forward in time to 2052, as an Australian, I might see this. Because, of course, China and Australia uh, have a very strong relationship in steel and coal. Something to propose. In 1952, this, this man, a much younger version of this man, uh, Nelson Mandela, served his first year in prison, six months. He went on to serve 27 years in prison and, of course, become the president of the Republic of South Africa. Talking about 27, that was the same age that this lady became the leader of the largest empire the world had ever seen. 27-year-old lady, two-thirds of the map, coloured pink. Interesting times. This was monumentous, you'd say. So it's not 2012, it's 1952. So it puts us into perspective, doesn't it? Should we really be afraid? Perhaps we're not. And again, those people that will have dinner with uh, come Christmas or Thanksgiving. Let's now look at the word dragon. So the word dragon, interestingly enough, has different relationships to different people. I asked you whether holiday was a good word, and everyone said, yes. Good. I asked you if this word was, and you said it was a bad word. Good and bad. Words have emotions. Now, if I, and I won't, if I ask you about <coughs> dragon, what will you say? Now, don't say anything, because we have a mixture of local Chinese, and we have a group of foreigners in this room today. I'm going to ask the oracle. If I put the word dragon into Google, what will I get? And I get this image. Dark, evil, fire-breathing, and frightening. It's very interesting. And it's not just Google that says this. It's society. It's, it's modern society. Movies of today highlight the dragon as a very dark creature. Um, this is not a Western movie, but it did very well in the West, and it's a very violent movie at that. Now, if I take the Chinese word for dragon, which is long, this is the simplified and here's the tradition, and I put this into the other oracle, if I do, I get a very different picture. I get an image of regal, I get an image of, uh, let's say, uh, relaxed, calming, and perhaps even harmonious. This is a very different image for the same, what is essentially the same word. And as you may know, those of you who've studied a bit of Chinese will recognize this meaning Longde Chuanren, which means descendants of the dragon. And it is how Chinese see themselves. Now, interestingly, 
If they had chosen the panda, and they called themselves descendants of the panda, <laughs> perhaps politically we wouldn't see the same tension that we do today. To, to highlight why dragging is not something to be feared, while this movie was about Gong Fu, it was more about love. It was about friendship. It was about the beauty of China. And this more, uh, perhaps a lower budget, uh, Shao Bai, <laughs> Bai Long, which means Little White Dragon, starring Cecilia Chung, who's perhaps more famous for her off-screen movies than her on-screen. This movie was a romantic comedy. There were no ghouls, there were no goblins, there were no rings. There were no fire-breathing dragons. Dragon to Chinese is something to be loved, not to be feared. And when the Chinese do cross that boundary, when occasionally the dragon of China becomes somewhat entwined into the dragon of Western mythology, the Chinese rebel. This was a stamp that was proposed in the beginning of this year, a stamp that will commemorate the beginning of the year of the dragon. And a lot of Chinese rebelled against this. They said it, it doesn't represent the true heart of the Chinese. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope today that I have made a positive impact on your view of the time that we live in and the dragon that we live in. We are not dealing with a fire-breathing evil dragon. We are in fact living with a kite-flying beautiful animal. Thank you.